Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Our Valley. Today, I'll be talking with Emmett Sweeney about the works of Herbert Illig versus Gunnar Heinsohn, both first millennium AD chronology revisionists. I'd like to thank you again, Emmett, for coming on. Um, and if you want to just go ahead and jump right in, you can go ahead and jump yeah. right in. I'm, I apologize. We have a slight echo. We're doing this from Ireland to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, pretty much USA. So we have some technical issues, but we're still going to go forward and go forth with it. We're going to talk today about the ideas of Illig versus Heinsohn in the first millennium AD controversy. So take it away, Emmett. Get right to it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, Herbert Illig and his colleague Chris Marx early, I think it was 1992, um, noticed that there was a paper published about medieval forgeries. Now, it's kind of a well-known that a lot of medieval documents ha were forgeries. There was a, the famous donation of Constantine and the Isidorian Decretals and various others. Um, and that these forgeries forged mainly by monks working in um, monasteries, scriptorum, scriptore in the monasteries, uh, were commissioned by the church to forge these, um, these documents in order to provide, uh, what do you call a precedent? And uh, for example, the donation of Constantine was forged in order to give the church precedence over the emperor, uh, at that time, the Holy, Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and it was forged, as far as I believe, in the 11th century, when the church was having some kind of a major disputes with the secular authorities over um, over jurisdiction, over the, the, the power that they had, okay? Now, this, I, I can't remember the name of the article, exactly where it was published, but there was a whole kind of a symposium on, on the issue, as far as I remember, and, and, and several documents were published anyway. And uh, Chris, uh, Herbert Elig and Chris Marks were reading it and discussing it. And one of the things that was said in the, in the report was that um, a lot of the forgeries, the medieval forgeries, which allegedly dated from the 8th or 9th century, it said seemed to have an anticipatory purpose. In other words, although they were written in the 8th, 7th, 8th or 9th century, they only became useful to certain authorities, usually church authorities, uh, in the 11th, 12th and 13th centuries. <laughs> Which struck Herbert Illig and Chris Marks as kind of a weird. And they began to look more closely into this whole question of uh, medieval forgeries and the, the Dark Age, the darkest of the Dark Age. Now, remember, some people call the period between the fall of the Western Empire, Western Roman Empire, 476, I believe, and the beginning of the Renaissance. They call that whole period, the whole medieval period, the Dark Age. But more recently, the, the name, the word of the term has been reserved for roughly the 7th to the 10th or 11th century uh, during the, Vi the Viking invasions and the, and the, Mag the, Mag the Magyar or the, the Hungarian invasions and the Islamic invasion of Spain. And that, that period is kind of considered the darkest of the dark age. There's, there's nothing before around 1000 or 950 or 60. That's when castles began to be built, mainly of wood at the beginning and then of stone, and then the big cathedrals began to be erected in the... And people now talk about the, an 11th century renaissance, actually, because in the 11th century, suddenly there's, there's these large ca stone castles beginning to appear all over Northern Europe and, and, and large cathedrals. And that was the first major building that was done since late antiquity. Now, when late antiquity 
actually begins. That's another issue we'll discuss. I'll talk about that in a minute. However, it is generally accepted that late antiquity begins roughly after the reign of Justinian, the emperor Justinian of uh, Constantinople or Byzantium, whatever you want to call him. Justinian um, in the 6th century um, attempted to reconquer the Western Empire, which had fallen into the hands of you know, barbarian kings, mainly Germanic kings, like the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and the Vandals. There was a Vandal kingdom in North Africa. Um, to call these kings at that time barbarians is a bit of a misnomer. I mean, they, they were Romanized and they, they took Roman titles like consul and senator and all this kind of stuff. And they regarded themselves as, as Romanized. And anyway, Justinian had some, some success in reconquering Italy and parts of Spain and North Africa and more or less establishing Roman control, as they would call it, over parts of the Western Empire again. And he constructed some major buildings in Italy and, and, and various parts of the West. Um, San, Rival, San um, Vitali in Ravenna is a great, uh, magnificent cathedral church, basilica, which was constructed around five 560, I believe. Um, and a few churches after that, the, the, the Byzantium or the Eastern Empire lost control of Italy shortly after that. And there were several smaller churches constructed in Italy after that, up until about 600, 610, and then nothing. And that was a pattern all over the Western Empire. Not in the Eastern Empire, I have to say, but certainly in the Western Empire. And from roughly between about 610, 620, until about 950, there was virtually nothing. I mean, England, for example, was allegedly being Christianized after the mission of St. Augustine in 596, I think it was, to Canterbury, and he built a small church there, and churches began to spring up all over England, allegedly during this Anglo-Saxon period. But virtually nothing can be shown. There was some some evidence of church building around 600 and 620, 630, uh, and then nothing again until about 950. And then there are more Anglo a few more Anglo-Saxon churches, usually in a fairly modest scale, nothing like the massive cathedrals of later time. So roughly between three for three, 300 years, there's, there's, there's no real evidence of architecture anywhere in Europe, in Western Europe anyway. I, I mean, absolutely nothing. It was, it's a complete blank. Um, and as it turns out, it's the same in Eastern Europe, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so Illig and Marx began to look at this question and they began to think, is that whole period of fabrication, is the whole all these chronicles, the Anglo-Saxon chronicle and this chronicle and that chronicle that allegedly um, record the events of this, this dark age, this, this 7th, 8th, 9th and 10th centuries. Are, are, are they all forgeries? And he began to look at the archaeology in greater detail. And he came, uh, Herbert Illig in particular came to the conclusion these, these three centuries never existed. They're, they're a complete fabrication. They're a complete fabrication. Um, now, to clinch the deal, he looked then at Byzantium. Now, the Constantinople was never invaded by you know, Huns or Vandals or Goths. The, the, it's commonly said that there was a dark age in the West because the West was overrun by barbarians and the barbarians were so stupid and so ignorant and um, uncivilized that they couldn't appreciate Roman civilization and they couldn't maintain it. And they just let, let things go to pot. You know, they preferred to live in mud huts full of smoke and mosquitoes <laughs> rather than live in these luxurious Roman villas, which they neglected and abandoned, right? But that's not what the evidence shows at all. Um, before I talk about Byzantium, 
the Eastern Roman Empire. I want to go back to the West for a minute. The Bio Tapestry is a pictorial, it's a cartoon representation of the conquest of England by the Normans. Now, if you look at the Bio Tapestry, you can see uh, King Harold and Duke, uh, Prince William, Duke William, and they're sitting in their palaces. And these are clearly in the Roman style. They have the portico, they have the triangular front, they have the Roman style tiles, they have the Roman pillars. And it's clearly, these are clearly some form of Roman palaces or uh, fairly large Roman villas. And this is, this, this is the pattern um, throughout. When, when architecture is re-established, when, when it does occur, when stone architecture does occur again in the West in the 10th and 11th centuries, it's, it's identical to late, late Roman. In fact, it's actually called Romanesque. It's as if those 300 years never existed. This is a kind of a, there's a direct, now it's now said that oh, what, what the stonemasons of the 10th and 11th centuries were doing was they were copying the styles of Roman uh, structures that were still standing. But that doesn't make sense. You know, to build something of that size, you have to have a, a tradition of architecture. Now, the great chapel at Aachen in Germany, supposedly constructed for Charlemagne. Now, this is another topic we'll discuss later, Charlemagne, in the, um, in the late 8th or 9th century, is clearly based on San Vitale, uh, the basilica built by, um, by, just, by Emperor Justinian in uh, Ravenna in Italy in the in the seventh in the sixth century it's clearly based so this Aachen church is clearly based on the Ravenna church it's, it's very very similar design interior and exterior the same kind of pillars same kind of a dome etc but a, a close examination which Herbert Early carried out of the architecture of Aachen proves that it wasn't built in the time of Charlemagne. In fact, nothing was built in the time of Charlemagne in the late 8th, 9th century. The Aachen Cathedral, the Aachen Basilica in Germany, was clearly constructed in the 11th century. So that opens up a huge gap between Ravenna in the 6th century and Aachen in the 11th century. Again, that's you're talking about two, four, 400 years, almost 500 years of a gap. Yet the, the, the builders of the Aachen Cathedral weren't, they weren't obviously just looking at Ravenna. They were, they were trained by people who, who could build structures like Ravenna, like the dome at Ravenna, etc. So there was many indicators that there was a continuity between late antiquity and the medieval period, the high medieval period, beginning in um, the 11th century, 10th, late 10th, 11th century. As I say, people even talk about a 10th, 11th century renaissance now because there's a great, there's a great flowering of culture. You know, universities start to get established in Europe around the 11th century. Massive cathedrals start to be constructed um, of a, truly kind of a massive architecture in Romanesque style and, you know, deliberately modeled on Roman architecture. Now, you, could, you might argue, uh, it might be plausible to say, okay, you know, the West did fall and the, the barbarians who took over just really couldn't appreciate this. But after a few centuries, they, they gradually were civilized and Christianized and they, they began to realize, oh, you know, we want to reconstruct Rome and, uh, you know, the Roman civilization and the, the Holy Roman Empire was established and all this, a, de a deliberate attempt to reestablish Roman civilization. But how is it that no architecture at all, no archaeology even, and this is the crucial point, no archaeology, hardly a coin, hardly a settlement, anything can be shown 
for some of these, you know, three centuries, two, three, four centuries at times. And there are many, many weird things, which I'll, I'll talk about later, but it turns out a close examination of the chronicles from these periods, which was claimed to cover these centuries, are um, duplicates and, you know, characters from the 7th century and the 6th century are duplicated and triplicated in the 8th, 9th and 10th centuries in order to fill out, you know, slight changes are, are made here and there, but they're, they're clearly duplicated characters, the identical lives, etc., etc. Now, looking at the, the Eastern Roman Empire, which didn't fall to the barbarian hordes, you know, Constantinople never was overrun by Goths or Vandals or Huns, okay? And until the 1940s, historians talked about a flourishing civilization in Byzantium during, you know, the height of the Dark Ages in Europe. The Byzantium continued to be some kind of a beacon of uh, Roman civilization and classical learning. But then archaeology got in the job in Constantinople from the 1940s onwards. And sure enough, um, archaeologists found a flourishing civilization from the time of Constantine. Uh, he re renamed Byzantium as Constantinople around, I think it was around 320. And huge structures were built in the centuries after that, right up till the time of Justinian and just a little bit after, up until about 600 again, 620. And then nothing, nothing at all, until about 950. So you've got, just, you've got three, around 300 years, but there's nothing. And then churches and basilicas and buildings begin to appear again in the 950s and 960s. Now that goes even for small uh, artifacts, virtually no coins of any kind, even copper coins, have been found for the 8th, 9th, and part of the 10th century in Constantinople. For all the great, these so-called uh, emperors, these Byzantine emperors that supposedly reigned at this period, there's almost no, or virtually, or in fact, no evidence of their existence. Now and again, uh, a coin or some which has a name like uh, Romanus on it. But that could be any of them. I mean, there's several emperors Romanus, but they try to, you know, desperately almost try to suggest, oh, this, this is probably, it could be one of the Romanus of the 8th century. We'll, we'll say that's him. But curious, curious enough, when, when large amounts of coins begin to appear again around 950, they are identical in design to the coins of Heraclius of 620, 630. Identical. There's no change at all. And it's the same with the architecture, the basilicas, the churches that were built around 610, 620, 630 are identical to the churches that appear in 920, 930, 950. So, Ili came to this astonishing conclusion that um, there was no, that these three centuries are a fab fabrication. They never existed. And uh, he wrote a book, he wrote several books on the subject, you know, um, the Das Erfundene Mittelalter, the, the Invented Middle Age, okay? And several other books dealing with, you know, more uh, detailed uh, studies of certain aspects of the Invented Dark Age. Now, I could, I could go into much more detail regarding this period and we'll right. discuss it later obviously some parts of it right but we'll leave right. it at that at the moment now you Gunnar Heinsen agreed you know and come up here for a second you can take a pause before we get to that part about Gunnar so you bought out a lot of information so the uh rule of the Carolingians um, yeah, would be like 750 to about 887 or so AD. Yeah, so yeah, he's Illig's purporting that that period of the Frankish Charles line of rulers just did simply did not exist. Yes, it's, ficti it's fictitious. Is it um, the, the, the character of Car Car uh, Charles the Great or Carol 
Carol Del Grosso as they call them in German or Charlemagne in Greek and in, <laughs> in French is based on a, a Austro Ostrogothic king Theodoric who reigned in the 6th century, early 6th century and in maybe Theoda, Theodahat, another uh, Ostrogothic king Okay. Uh, so the, the, these, the, the character of Charlemagne is based around a character who actually lived in the, in the 5th and 6th centuries, okay? Characters that live in the 5th century. So he's a fictitious character because, again, uh, Illy could find no evidence, no contemporary uh, architecture from the so-called Carolingian Renaissance that is supposed to have occurred in the 8th and 9th centuries. There's no evidence of it at all. There's a, there's a couple of coins and medallions and all that allegedly are you know uh, dated from the time, but there's no there's no architecture. There's nothing that can be definitely assigned to that period anywhere in Western Europe. Nowhere it doesn't it doesn't exist. Mm. I'm uh, I'm fading out here in the twilight again. Uh, the twilight okay. zone, as I say. Can I put that light on and and shift sure. shift myself around, sure. but Sean? Sure, I'm going to uh, bring up an article. Right. Um. Sorry, sorry. Hold on. Um, and it's found as following. I will share this. Yeah. I prefer to use a natural light, Sean, but uh, the the light's fading here now. And okay. at this time of the year, uh, it this, gets uh, dark about. We, we, I'm at about uh, quarter past eight here in uh, in Ireland, and it's starting to get dark now. Yeah. Right, right. Um, this article here is from the uh, UNS Review. Uh, let yeah. the reader. <laughs> Beware, I'll say. Um, this is a very controversial website. Um, this article is from September 9th, 2020. Um, this article deals with much of what we're speaking of right now. For some reason, it's not moving. I'm moving it, but it's not moving on the screen. But uh, it's moving now. There we go. <laughs> There's a bit of a delay. I'm kind of being slick here with two computers. Yeah. Nonetheless. As we read down, it's going to deal with this, uh, with the German Zietenspringers, if I'm pronouncing it correct. Um, in the mid 1990s, independent from Russian school, German scholars Herbert Illig, Hans Jurich Niemitz, U Topper, Manfred Zeller, and others became convinced that something is wrong with the end, except the chronology of the Middle Ages. Now, I learned this in high school back in the 80s that we do have a Dark Age. In European history, though, now, for some reason, they don't see it that way. I guess they changed their minds, yeah. those modern scholars. Nonetheless, only in the time jumpers, they suggested that approximately 300 years from 600 to 900 A.D. never existed. English summaries of their approach have been pr produced by Niemitz, and they're listed. Uh, the German discussion originally focused on Charlemagne and Illig's book. Sources on Charlemagne are often contradictory and unreliable. His main biography, Engard's Vita Caroli, supposedly written for the benefit of prosperity rather than to allow the shades of oblivion to blot out the life of this king, the noblest and greatest of his age, and his famous deeds, which men, men of later times will scarcely be able to imitate from England's forward, or Engelhard's forward, is recognizably molded on Suetonius' life of the, of the first Roman Emperor Augustus. So you see uh -huh. what you know, he was talking about is right here for us. Uh, Charlemagne's empire itself lasting only 45 years from 800 to his dislocation in three kingdoms defies reason. Freeland and, Freeland and Gregorius in his History of the City of Rome, the Middle Ages, eight volumes, 1872 writes, the figure of the great Charles can be compared to a flash of lightning who came out of the night, illuminated the earth for a while, and then left night behind him, quoted by Illig. Is the shooting star just an illusion? And the legends about him virtually devoid of relation to history. The main yeah. problem with Charlemagne is his architecture. His Palatine Chapel in Aachen, which we talked about, exhibits a technological advance of 
200 years. For example, arched aisles not seen before the 11th century. On opposite, Charlemagne's residence in Ingelheim was built in the Roman style of the second century with materials supposedly recycled from the second century. Illigan Neiman's challenge such absurdities and concluded that Charlemagne is a mythical predecessor invented by the Atonian emperor to, to, to legitimate their imperial claims. All Carolingians of the 8th, 9th, the, excuse me, and there were also fictitious, they were also, their wars were also fictitious, I'm sorry, and time span of roughly 600 to 900 CE is in a fan of era. Now, Gunnar Heinsohn objects to this theory on a nuministic ground. About 15,000 coins have been found bearing the name Carlos, alternatively, Carolus or Carlos Magnus. Now, how do you feel about the fact that Heinsohn is saying, well, we do have enough coins to justify that period? What would be your rebuttal to that? Uh, um, Herbert Illig's answer to that, and I would say my answer is that, in fact, one... Uh, Theodoric uh, did call himself Carl, Carlos, uh, Carl, Carlos. Carl is a German word, and it means a warrior, um, a strong man. And it was, it was, I think it was used basically as a title. So all these coins that belong and have been found with that name on it, uh, as I say, they're 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 very classically Roman looking, and uh, you know they obviously come from a an age much earlier than the 8th or 9th century. And that, uh, so these, the, these coins are actually almost certainly belong to the great king, uh, German king Theodoric, um, or perhaps to Theodahat, who uh, slightly before the Theodoric um, uh, started to, to describe himself as a Western emperor. Now, the, the issue here was, after the fall of the Western Empire, after its abolition in 476, uh, Italy was ruled by this Ostrogothic kingdom. As I say, uh, Justinian briefly con reconquered it in the middle of the, seventh, the 6th century. But before that, the Ostrogoths, kind of a, as rulers of Rome, some of them began to get kind of uppity and began to um, look at themselves as essentially Roman emperors. And they began, they began to style themselves as Roman emperors. Now, at some stage, uh, the, the greatest of these, Theodoric, was um, was in control of large parts of France, as well as, um, or Gaul, as it was still called at that time, as well as Italy and various other regions. He built a, a substantial empire. And they uh, him and Theodahat, who came before him, actually began to mint coins with their image on it, posing as Roman emperors. Now, before that, no barbarian king of the West, either the Visigoths in Spain or the Vandals in North Africa or the Goths in uh, Italy, the Ostrogoths in Italy or the Franks, dared to um, print coins or stop, you know, mint coins with their image. They minted coins with the image of the Eastern Emperor, the Emperor in Constantinople, thereby keeping alive the fiction that the, you know, both halves of the empire were still united. But at least one of the Ostrogothic kings began to mint coins with his image on it, and this was seen as a, a direct challenge to Byzantium, that a German king, a barbarian, was claiming to be a Roman emperor. So I suspect part of these, some of these coins actually belong to Theodaha. Now, I'm not 100% sure whether Theodoric, who came after him, also minted coins with his picture on it. Um, so certainly the, the coins that are found allegedly belonging to this 8th, 9th century Charlemagne um, are in fact uh, coins of uh, Ostrogothic kings who lived centuries before that. Um, that's how Illy would answer it, and, and frankly, that's how I, I would answer it. Mm -hmm. um, now, the the issue of how many centuries of the of the first millennium need to be abolished. This is where um, Gunnar Heinsohn came into direct conflict with Herbert Illy until 2012. So from 1992. 
until 2012, we're talking about 20 years, uh, Gunnar agreed and was a quite a vocal supporter of Herbert Elig's thesis that the, basically the three centuries of uh, between roughly 616 and or 615 and 614 and 9, 914 or something didn't exist, that these are fictitious centuries. But in 19, uh, 20, 20, 2012, Gunnar suddenly announced that um, this is wrong and that in fact not three but seven centuries of the first millennium need to be removed and are fictitious. Now, do you want me to explain why he came to that conclusion? Well, yeah, I mean, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the article and kind of lead in with it because the article leads right into it. So I'm going right. to pull the article back up um, and read from the article. Uh, let's see. So it's Gunnar Heinsohn's breakthrough. Gunnar Heinsohn from the University of Bremen is, in my view, and this is written by uh, Laurent Gagnon. He's, he's a French writer. He's written a book about the first millennium controversy. All of his articles are put into a book. Um, Gunnar Heinz from the University of Bremen is, in my view, the most interesting, convincing scholar in the field of chronology revisionism. His recent articles are also posted on this website. His 2016 conference in Toronto makes a good introduction. Heinz Heinz focuses on hard archaeological evidence and insists that stratigraphy is the most important criterion for dating archaeological finds. He shows time and time again stratigraphy contradicts history and that archaeologists should have logically forced historians into a paradigm shift. Unfortunately, in order to be consistent with prefabricated chronology, archaeologists unknowingly betray their own craft. When they dig up the same artifacts or building structures in different parts of the world and they assign them to different periods in order to satisfy historians. And when they find in the same place and layer mixtures of artifacts that have already been attributed to different periods, they explain it away with the ludicrous heirloom theory or call them art collections. Uh, this article is going to kind of give a really good summary of early antiquity, middle antiquity, late antiquity, but we are going to talk about Heinzone and essentially where he came up with the very and extremely radical idea of 700 years. And I've also said that's, that's pretty extreme. Um, he presents a pretty compelling argument at least, but we can start talking about how Heinzone came up with the idea of 700 years. At, and I'll also say, we know history, historical periods are usually divided into three segments. The math is kind of even here. We're going through first, first through the 10th centuries. There are still roughly 300 years or so uh, in chronology. And I'm saying roughly. We're trying to keep the math pretty simple because, you know, I've even said, well, maybe uh, 600 years. 700 is very radical and 300 is very conservative. So this is this is a very interesting part of the discussion uh, that we're at right now. But if you want to start to elaborate on Heinzone, uh, Emmett, you can go ahead and uh, take it away. Yeah, thanks. Now, the Gunnar Heinzone, as you noted, there is very um, concerned about actual stratigraphy, strat what is found by archaeologists in the ground. And he noticed that uh, from about the middle of the third century, in many sites, and if not most sites in Western Europe, the architecture largely disappears, the classic Roman ar architecture, and there's a layer then of um, what is called dark earth. Now, it's a very uh, uh, rich, um, humus-laden, and uh, it's very it's, 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 it's black soil, essentially. And it contains a lot of stuff in it, but it's, it's, it's there's no, there's no, um, there's very little growth, there's very little signs of um, actual architecture in many of the Roman cities of the Western Empire after about, uh, as I say, roughly the middle of the third century, say 240, 250 AD. Um, now, Gunnar interpreted that as a sign, uh, sign of some kind of a catastrophic event. This was not the result of barbarians or anything like that. He said it was some form of natural catastrophe. And he noticed in the Eastern Empire, now it's quite different in 
the Eastern Roman Empire, that there there's architectural continuity through the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, but sometime in the seventh century, say about 720, 30, there's a huge uh, layer of debris covering many of the cities of the Eastern Empire in North Africa, in Syria, in Turkey. And this is called the Younger Fill. It's a large area of um, sediment, an Aeolian sediment. It's, it's, there's no sign of habitation in it. It's obviously carried there by uh, the wind or by flood or whatever. And sometimes it's several meters deep. Now, Gunnar, came the, Gunnar Heinsen came to the conclusion that, a radical conclusion, that the dark earth found above many of the towns and settlements in Western Europe was contemporary with <laughs> the uh, younger fill sediment found in the Eastern Roman Empire. And that both belong together and both are the signatures of the same natural catastrophe. Right. So he was saying, he came to this radical conclusion that the Eastern Roman emperors, emperors of uh, an Eastern Roman civilization of the 4th, 5th and 6th century are duplicates and is a duplicate of Roman, classical Roman civilization of the 1st, 2nd and 3rd centuries. So, for example, he, he, he imagined or he, he claimed that there was evidence that um, Diocletian, for example, was an alter ego, alter ego, I think, of Augustus and various others. I, I can't, um, I can't remember the exact alter ego identifications that he was suggesting, um, because I never agreed with them, to be honest with you. And I have, I have, I feel very, very good reasons for disagreeing. But anyway. So he came to this radical conclusion that Western Roman civilization ended completely around 240, 250 AD, that there was some kind of a cataclysmic event over the entire world. And it basically uh, leveled, basically flattened Roman civilization. And that all the centuries after that, which we mainly fill up by the civilization of the Eastern Roman Empire, or the Byzantine Roman Empire, as we call it, um, are fictitious, and that they are just duplicates of what was happening in the first, second, and third centuries. And that the only real uh, revival of Western civilization began around 950, which he would then claim is 250. So by 300 which he would say was the year 1000. Um, churches began to get built again, larger cathedrals began to be constructed. Constructed. So the 11th century Renaissance was for him a 4th century Renaissance. And that the 700 years between roughly 250 and two, uh, 950 never existed at all. So as you can imagine, that conclusion caused a major rift between him and Herbert Illig, who had been close co collaborators before that. So um, that's how Gunnar came to his conclusion. Now, um, I would, maybe you could uh, elaborate yourself on some yeah. of the details of uh, how he kind of filled out that argument. Personally, yeah. I disagree with it, and I, I feel I have very, very good reasons for disagreeing with it. Right. But, you know, maybe you could uh, uh, point out some of the parallels he said, you know, existed between, you know, uh, Roman civilization of the early period and yeah. later. Um, he, he, he really, through compelling argument, uh, shows that in we'll call high imperial Roman antiquity of the first several centuries AD, that once you get to the 10th century AD, you have no evolution in sewers, water pipes, latrines, building, et cetera, et cetera, so on. In Rome and other places where this dark earth or mud was thrown over a lot of these structures, didn't bring them down to the ground, 
but still cover them to where his people started moving out. I know Ravenna became the capital of Rome, which is another part of the argument. Um, but he used what you see is almost what you get. This is how it looked. Um, there is no evolution. I think it's a lot harder with the rulers and uh, emperors, maybe. That argument gets a little deep. Uh, if there's duplicates, triplicates, uh, Doppler gangers, I call them. Um, but it's more based on the building structures. And I hate to say, but what kind of makes more sense? So yeah. if you just put, if you put it in a nutshell, and I'll go to some slides too. We'll go to some slides. If I had to put it in a nutshell, coins, there's no evolution of coins. There's no evolution of architecture. We know that for a period, in which what um, Emmett is talking about right now, we don't have literature for a period, uh, for the traditional dates, at least of the Dark Ages in Europe. But he's using a lot of the architectural um, advancements and or non-advancements to buttress his entire argument, including coins, art, uh, fine art, if you will, mosaics, uh, motifs, um, floors, tiles. He kind of puts all the all the um, evidence on the table and says, well, this it only looks like we have three centuries, which is extremely radical because now at least let's say in the case of uh, language, we do. It does look like Latin lasts a lot longer without any evolution than it should. And if we place vault, Latin's vault, the Latin Vulgate and Jerome's Vulgate into its context of what we have right now, we're essentially, and let me make sure I have some dates kind of correct. So if you're going from like 383 to 404 AD, you're essentially sliding it backwards to even be much more contemporary with the first three centuries, at least of uh, that time period, which again is extremely radical. Um, we can look at some slides too. I'm going to uh, attempt to go through the slide presentation here. And this is the summary of Jerusalem's first millennium AD, a thousand years long or only 300. Why I chose this is because there's a hundred or more slides. So I'm just going to kind of roughly go through the summaries. Um, and these are available um, also for, for download from academia.edu directly and um, also from q-mag.org, which is uh, Anna Marie de Grazia's website. Um, they are available for download. He has always said that he, they're, for, they're free. Uh, he doesn't charge for them. So nonetheless, I'm just going to kind of go through some slides and get to some of the more interesting parts. We do see... So me and Emin have talked about this. If you're proposed, if he's proposing a cosmic catastrophe, well, it didn't wipe everything down to nothing, you know, worldwide, if you will. It looks like there was some sort of destructive event that did cause flooding and this material to be thrown over aqueducts and different various ports being moved um, or underwater. Now, I'm just going to kind of fly through these because this is a very long slide presentation. I'm going to try to get to some of the parts that have more pictures. So we have this slide here. Uh, art historians declare the parallels between the 1st century BCE and, and BCE AD in the 3rd to 4th century AD is perfectly normal because later emperors would have had uh, concisely imitated the 300 years of the earlier ones even down to their styles and postures. And he's showing where you have at least for a 300, we'll say period of time, 300 years, things do indeed look the same. Now I know we evolve and do things much faster these days, but it still looks like things are being imitated from different time periods. Here you have uh, swords, um, the uh, Eastern Roman sword with the bird handle versus the Byzantium style from the third and fourth century AD look pretty much the same. I'm trying to get to the churches. I don't even know where that slide is, but I'm just going to kind of run through these. Um, this is Jerusalem. We're kind of, we can talk about Jerusalem because it, it's, it's inclusive of the discussion. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get, there we go. Let's get to some pictures. Uh, hunting lions left in the Rose, Roman mosaic with the lion 
killing a Nagra from Tunisia, second century AD, and right above the Roman mosaic with the line killing a gazelle, gazelle from the third in the century AD in the style of the second century. Uh, so we have still Roman style mosaic works matching even that that goes far as the eighth century from the um, from the Umiads artwork pr pretty much is the same from the first, second, at least to the eighth centuries, the artwork, the um, peacock mosaic here. They have the first century AD peacock mosaic from a column in Pompeii before 79 AD. And on the right, we have the Umiad eighth century peacock mosaic floor from the path of the so-called Palace of Hisham, 691 to 743 AD. Still same style. And this also, you know, for people that have read Heinzone's work, comes in conflict with uh, the Illig Dark Age and or Heinzone's uh, work. It, Islam becomes greatly conflicted with the dates we've been giving versus what the stratigraphy would at least uh, suggest. There is the uh, Umayyad Damascus from the 8th century. Um, we have two mosaics, one from the 8th century on the left. Basically, we have one from the 1st century on the right. The mosaics look strikingly similar. Uh, Jewish coins from the 437 BC, and we have the Umiyah coin of the 8th century AD, essentially one and the same. I think, you know, Emmett Notes sees what I'm getting at here just by running through the slides. We're just looking for a quick comparison. This slide is always interesting. You have Jewish coins from 134 to 104 BC, top left. And as we get down to the bottom right, we have the, the Arab Umiyah coins with the menorah from 695 to 750 AD. We don't see much of an evolution in those particular coins. The summary of the Arab coinage, and this becomes important because if, and I know people have say, I can't read the charts. I can't read his, his uh, PowerPoints. I'm gonna make it easy. What we have between in, in the middle columns that are in blue, they're all color coded. You don't have writings from the first to, through basically the seven centuries with, for, for the Arab culture. There's a gap. It's a huge gap. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, 622 AD, we have a resurgence because then we have the beginning of Islam. But these, these are very detailed uh, slides. We have the Nabatean um, bust on the left. We have a Umiyad bust on the right, separated by some uh, seven centuries. Millefiori blown glass. Um, Roman in Egypt from the first century BC AD, compared to the bottom right of the um, Abbasid Melifor blown glass from the eighth or ninth century, pretty much the same stuff. It's the same archaeology found within the same strata level as what Heinzone's is saying. That and throughout Europe and other areas in the Near East, I'll call them. That Europe only has one strata layer with this material thrown on it, this dark earth. Though you may have, you know, several strata layers deep in Near East, a lot of this stuff is they it all matches up in terms of the art. The um, Abbasid Mulefiori blown glass here on the top left from the eighth ninth century A.D. and like right below it is the first century A.D. Same type glass of imperial antiquity. Same with the middle column of. Glass fragments, one's from the 9th century, one's from the 1st century. Another glass dish from the 8th century to the 4th century. Pretty much the same stuff. I'm going to skip forward because I know I'm not so much pressed for time, but I want to see if the churches are in there because he has, where if you look at, to put it in a nutshell, if you look at the ruins from the churches that are dated from the 6th to the 9th century, they're, they're dated late. So you date the churches late, Christians don't have churches in the first three centuries AD. They don't have them in, in the middle part centuries either. Then all of a sudden on the latter end, you have these churches, though they're in ruins, most of them. It makes more sense, stratigraphy wise, that these church churches belong in the first three centuries, according to Heinzon. That's according to him. Um, I'm trying to see if I can get to them because these slides are very interesting. And I didn't look through them. A lot before I pulled them up. I just know they're like well over a hundred. We may be running out, and they're on a different set of slides. Nonetheless, it's those churches, and they're scattered. Once I did a deep dive into the churches, 
this is, I'll, I'll go to this slide too. Once I did a deep dive, these churches are pretty much foundations. And he's saying that how can you date one from the sixth century, one from the ninth century, if they're all in the same strata level? So he's backdating them essentially to the first three centuries. Uh, this is the uh, Umayyad masonry of the seventh and eighth century, which directly sits on and imitates masonry of 70 AD. Now, if you look on the left, those Herodian courses one through seven look like the Umayyad courses one through four right above them. And then he shows you where the Temple Mount surface is on the other side, where your grade is. For, so from four counting to one, and then from seven counting to one will be below grade. Um, the 14 courses of the Ottoman period above are much smaller blocks. And you can distinctly see that there's a difference in the architecture. But right here, it doesn't look like there's much difference between the 19th uh, BC Herodian Ashlar uh, columns than the Umayyads of uh, 600 AD. It looks very, very peculiar um, that, again, and, and I was running through the slides rather quickly. Um, it just looks peculiar that things look the same. Um, and like I said, these weren't selected. I didn't take the time to really dissect the slides, which I should have. Nonetheless, he's saying architecture is essentially the same. And he uses this one source of a woman by the name of even her name is Lee, Leah Borelli. She's Italian. And she looks at the architecture, too, from the same sense that, hey, you have these buildings that are on opposite ends, essentially, of antiquity in terms of dating, but they're essentially the same. Same materials, et cetera, et cetera, so on. So just to kind of, and I just ran through them quick, and I know I was going real fast. Um, the church is just something that was very interesting to me, that Christians didn't build churches for the first three centuries. They built them later. And we know we can start proving the Christian movement from the 10th century moving forward without any issues. I think before that, it's literature sources, and we have to kind of paint the picture in our head, but we still don't have any synagogues and or churches for the early Christians. That's something that was quite interesting to me. I know I'm going on kind of fast and everything, but Emmett, you want to kind of, uh, what am I going to say, kind of just tag, tag along what I just said there? I'm going to look for another set of slides, like as as you're speaking, though. Do you want to just go ahead and rebuttal what I just said or what not? Okay. Yeah, right. Um, I disagree totally with what Gunnar is saying here. Um, you can tell the difference between art and uh, architecture of the Byzantine 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries at a glance from classical Roman art of the first three centuries. Um, you don't have to be an art expert. You don't have to be a historian. The coins are different, everything. Byzantine art is Christian through and through. The iconography uh, and the forms, of the, the, the actual forms used, the uh, motifs, everything is different. As I say, you don't, you, don't need to be, um, you don't need to be an art historian or some kind of an archaeologist or historian to tell the difference. You can tell the difference of the coins right away. From about uh, 300 AD or 250, the coins begin to change. The the emperor begins to wear a kind of a pearl, a kind of a pearl uh, crown on his head. And then the, from about six hundred um, or even earlier, the emperor's face begins to appear uh, not in profile anymore, but kind of a, in the you know face forward on the coin. And uh, that's completely different from classical age Roman coins. As I say, in classical age, Roman art, art is utterly pagan. There's not a trace anywhere of Christian iconography or um, imagery of any kind. Um, and it's not true to say that all these things are, are at the same level. In Rome, there is a, I can't, no, I can't remember the name of the church. Uh, I think it was San Clemente. I'm not too sure. There's a YouTube video about it, but the archaeology of San Clemente. There, so there's an 11th century church at the top. So about four or five meters below that, there is a 5th century church, an early Christian church. And about four or five meters before, below that, there is a, a Mithraeum, 
uh, temple to the god Mithras of the second century. And they're, they're separated from each other. The, the Mithras temple at the bottom from the 11th century temple at the top is separated by about 11 meters or 12 meters altogether, which is a, a tremendous depth. Um, so it's not true to say that these things all appear at the same level. Um, I, I feel that Gunnar was being selective. No, it's not. It's also true to say that many artifacts of later periods from the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries do, do mimic classical age Roman material. Because remember, the age of the great Caesars of Caesar himself, Julius Caesar and Augustus became kind of a, almost a, they became like religiously uh, center, a, 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 a kind of a, how would I say it, uh, an iconic uh, period for Roman civilization. Emperors were all called Caesar after Julius Caesar or Augustus. They got that name. So that period was was deliberately imitated, um, and consciously, uh, as I say, that was that process was still going on in the 11th and 12th century during the Romanesque period, and it was it was really ignited again in the Renaissance period, the 15th, 16th century, when there was out and out uh, deliberate attempts to imitate early Roman art of the um, of the first and second century. I remember um, a few years back, I was in Hungary and we were at a museum and I saw this piece of, uh, I think it was a mosaic. And I remember talking to um, one of my students at the time. I said, that looks like Roman. And then we read, this, there was a caption in Hungarian, a caption in English. In fact, it was Renaissance. Um, but it looked so much like Roman that, you know, it was almost impossible to tell the difference. So it was actually 15th, late 15th century, not you know, first or second century. As I say, the, the period of the early Caesars became the, um, the time to copy and the time to try to always recall, try to imitate for all subsequent Romans. As I say, they even, they even called themselves Caesar, all the emperors after that. Now, and a process that continued actually until modern times. The German, the German emperor was the Kaiser, and the um, the Russian emperor was the the Tsar, C Z A R, meaning the Caesar. Um, and that was that was a continuous process through Roman history, late Roman history, and the Middle Ages, and up until modern times. Um, now this, you actually notice the same thing at work in Egyptian history. There's a deliberate conservatism which goes into overdrive at times during the time of the, the Nubian pharaohs, Pharaoh um, Pianke and uh, Terhaka and uh, Tanutaman. There's a deliberate attempt to imitate the work of the pyramid builders, the, 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 the great period, the classic period of Egyptian civilization. And if you read the works of Flinders Petrie, he says it's almost impossible at times to tell which is the original uh, pyramid age from the time of Khufu or Hef, Khafri and which belongs to Terhaka or some of the some of the Nubian pharaohs. Okay, so there's a deliberate attempt to imitate the classical period. And as I say, Caesar, the, the, the life of Julius Caesar, the life of Augustus were regarded by subsequent generations of Romans as the classical period, the period to be copied, the period to be preserved. Um, but it, again, things evolved. And it is not true to say that there was no evolution. Furthermore, it's not true to say that these things are all found in the same strata. The other thing I would say is that the dark earth only occurs in cities and towns. It does not occur in country areas. If there was a catastrophe, it should occur over all of the landscape. You can find Roman villas and Roman settlements literally one inch under the earth in English fields. Okay, there's no layer of debris, there's no layer of anything like that. There's no evidence of this catastrophe. Um, the current, the accepted explanation is that following the plague of Justinian around 240, can't remember the exact dates, 240, 230 to, to 235 to about 240 or 50, can't remember. 
following the plague of Cyril, um, not so. What was it? The plague of ah, oh, that wasn't Saint Cyril. I can't remember. <laughs> I, I was talking about it the other day. I can't remember. The, the great plague struck uh, the Roman world around the two thirties and two forties. And it caused devastation. Rome was sitting on a demographic abyss, at the edge of an abyss before that. The Romans practiced very, very, um, very diligently a one child uh, per family policy. Um, infanticide was the norm and numerous Roman authors complain about it from Tertullius to Tacitus to Dio Cassius, you know, many of them complain about the Roman custom of killing their children. And uh, young baby girls were targeted in particular because a baby girl required a big dowry. And um, if you were an up-and-coming Roman family and you wanted to, your son to marry up or your family, your offspring to marry up, if you had a daughter, you had to pay a huge amount of money as dowry. If you had a son, it was the son that received the dowry. So there was a there was almost a deliberate policy of terminating young girls. Now this started with the Roman aristocracy, but it spread to the rest of Roman society because people copy what the aristocrats, what the ruling class do. So there was this a archaeologists have noticed even before the year two hundred a decline. The, the, the end of expansion of Roman towns begins around 150, not in the middle of the third century, as, as Gunnar was saying, but certainly before that, there's no more growth. If you look at Londinium, the Roman, uh, the Roman settlement of London, uh, capital of London, or you know, the province of Britannia, it grows from its establishment around 50 until about 150, and then there's no more growth. Uh, it remains kind of a steady then, and after 250, there's a marked decline, okay? And your dark earth appears over parts of the settlement. So clearly parts of the settlement are now being used, and this is the explanation for the dark earth. The plague massacred, it literally massacred millions of Roman citizens. It didn't spare age, sex, anything. Now, bear in mind, the Romans began with a disadvantage. There was a there was a huge sex imbalance. There were far more males than females. So there was already a, a, a gravest shortage of young women to replenish the population. And the, the, demog the demographic strength of a population depends on the number of fertile women. Nothing to do with men, you know. The way I put it, you know, if you put one man on a desert island with uh, 50 women, you know, in a hundred years, there's going to be several thousand offspring, <laughs> and very happy guy. Um, you put one woman on a desert island with fifty men, and in a hundred years, there's probably going to be very, very few people alive. You know, um, so the the demographic strength of the society depends on its females. There was already a huge sex imbalance before the plague of Cyprian. It was the plague of Cyprian. Um, the plague exterminated vast numbers of the Roman population. Now, the medieval plague, the plague of the 14th century, is estimated to have killed between one-third and two-thirds of the entire population of Europe. It took Europe 300 years to recover in terms of population from the plague of the 14th century. 300, three centuries. Now, that was during a period when the Roman Catholic Church ruled which forbade infanticide, which forbade abortion, and even forbade contraception. So it's still, even at that, it took, it took medieval Europe 300 years to recover demographically. Now, Rome in the mid-third century was a, and still almost exclusively, especially the Western provinces, a pagan society. They had no problem with infanticide. And so when the when the plague came, there were very fair, there was very very few people left, you know, alive to kind of a, maintain the borders. Rome, the empire begins to shrink. The Romans have to withdraw from Romania or Dacia. It was called back to the Danube. Parts of Germany are abandoned. Um, so there's there's a shrinkage, and the towns begin to shrink, and archaeologists see it. 
walls begin to be built around the towns from about um, 260 onwards. And they're much smaller. The, the, the defended area is much smaller than the previous Roman settlement, which weren't defended. They, def they depended on their defence to the Roman legions before that. Now they had to build walls. And from that point onwards, the Romans had to recruit huge numbers of barbarians into the armies. Uh, to replenish the numbers, because there were there were so many there were so many or so few Romans left, either to pay taxes or to defend the frontiers. So certainly from the middle of the third centuries, the Romans do cease to build great monument monument. There are very little. There is some monumental architecture, but much less than before. There are some things built by Constantine, and yes, they are built in the style of early Roman periods. And they do use cannibalized architecture from, um, you know, uh, statues, pillars, etc., marble edifices from earlier monuments. And that's a that's a process that is noticed all over the Western Empire that um, monuments of the first, second and third centuries are cannibalized in later monuments um, for obvious reasons. There are far fewer craftsmen about, there are far fewer artisans. There's just not as many people to do the work. Um, so there is a decline. Everybody accepts that. There was a major decline of the empire after the middle of the third century. Nobody denies it. And there was a catastrophe, but it wasn't It wasn't some form of cosmic catastrophe. It, it was a deadly plague, right? Now, the, the Eastern Empire didn't suffer as much, and there was a very good reason for that. The Eastern uh, provinces were closer to the homeland of Christianity, which is, of course, Palestine. And the Christian religion caught on very, very early. There were far greater numbers of Christians in Anatolia, which is Turkey now, in Syria and Palestine. Antioch was a major Christian center in Egypt and Alexandria. These, these regions had already been thoroughly Christianized. Not thoroughly Christianized. There was loads of pagans as well. But they had, there were far more Christians in the Eastern empires and the Eastern part of the empire than there were in the West. And so when the plague came, there were more females to regenerate the population. And uh, there was no, um, there was far less uh, tendency to, you know, commit infanticide or anything like that. So the, the population recovered quicker in the Eastern empires. Yes, there's a slight decline after about, this is what archeologists say, I'm not, you know, I, uh, you know, I haven't actually, you know, personally examined the sites, but this is, this is, this, there's a certain, de certain decline in the second half of the third century, but there's a recovery in the fourth century, and it gets, you know, the recovery speeds up in the fifth and sixth centuries. So these eastern provinces are flourishing, and as I said, the art, the art and architecture of that time are not the same as the first three centuries. As it, you don't have to be an expert, you don't have to be. Um, you don't have to be an art historian to realize that you're not looking at classical Roman art when you look at a mosaic. You go into the um, San Vitale in Ravenna, built by Justinian. It looks nothing like the early uh, work of the Roman emperors of um, of the first, second, and third centuries. Uh, you know, there's there's Christian imagery, the just the style of the the style of the figures. The dress of the figures is quite different, you know. Um, I don't deny that, you know, Gunnar was able to produce many parallels between you know, the first three centuries and later centuries. No, no question about it. But as I say, there, there has always been a deliberate imitation of classical Roman forms by later centuries. Um, it's a prestige thing. It's, uh, it's an honouring of um, the great period of Roman history. And... Um, the title of, you know, the title of Caesar and the title, the title of Senator, you know, the word senator was still used in Rome in the 12th, 11th, 12th and 13th centuries. So there was this always this deliberate attempt to harp back to the first, you know, couple of centuries of imperial Rome as the as the classic period of Roman civilization. And that explains a lot, you know, but as I say, to say, to, to claim that, they, you know, the, the, the temple, the Basilica of San San Vitali is the same as a basilica of the first or second century is 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 not true. As the fact that the Rome, the Christians didn't build churches in the first two three centuries, 
Christianity was outlawed. It was a it was an illegal um, religion. You could be killed. <laughs> Vast numbers of people were killed for you know having been discovered secretly practicing the rites of Christianity. The persecutions weren't um, they weren't consistent. They weren't always the rules weren't always uh, enforced with the same ruthlessness. But Christianity remained uh, an outlawed system until Constant Constantine didn't become a Christian until his death is. All he did was he legalized it. That was the only thing he did. He legalized it in uh, the Edict of Milan, I think it was in 300 and, I don't know, 15 or something like that. I can't remember the exact date. Uh, I'm not good with precise dates. But uh, so th there, there's, a, you know, there's a very simple explanation for the fact that there was no churches in the first three centuries because Christianity was an illegal religion. But there is evidence of, you know, surreptitious Christian activity in, in, uh, in Pompeii, for example, which was destroyed by um, Vesuvius around 80, uh, 80, well, I say 79, I think, late 79, 80. There are a couple of uh, bits of Christian graffiti, you know, so there's a there's an attempt to, um, there's the beginning of um, uh, a surreptitious Christian activity, but it's, it's tiny. You know, if you look at you look at the ruins of Pompeii and Her Herculaneum, there's no trace. Uh, there's no obvious trace of Christianity. It's all pagan. Uh, there's 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 mosaics everywhere. There are uh, you know things, uh, frescoes and all that. But it's all from pagan um, Greco-Roman uh, mythology. There's nothing I, uh, Christian. I feel like there. the say, a couple of a couple of bits of graffiti here and there. Yes. I want to interject for a second because we still have the early church history still within the first, we'll say, four centuries um, A.D. So there is a literary um, movement going on. So it wouldn't make sense that the early church fathers were compiling everything and there was no there were no churches. That's just that's just a, a, a comment because I want to move on still to a couple more yeah. slides. While we're kind of on topic, let me see if I can yeah. do this real quick. All right. And this is the uh, Richard Krautenheimer slides, I call them. And we have, just to do it quickly, old St. Peter in Rome, 4th century AD. The St. Paolo yeah. in Rome, 4th century. San Epice, 4th century. Then we have 8th century and 8th century in Germany. Now... Um, what Gunnar Holmes is proposing with all these styles of buildings. Yeah. It gets complicated. Basilicas from the 5th and 9th centuries re resemble pagan basilicas of the 2nd century. Only the very early buildings of the Carolingian period followed the 4th century patterns. Later churches yeah. resumed the model of early family. So what we're still claiming here historically is Renaissance after Renaissance after Renaissance, yeah. which you know, I'm not convinced that there's all these renaissances because whether we take Illig side or Heinzone side, you know, one being more radical and one being more conservative, we still see some similarities architecturally that a renaissance, fine. That we're going to have renaissances. We had renaissances in Pittsburgh and I, and I get all that. It just seems yeah. rather yeah. odd because we still have the issue of the one strata layer and According to Heinzon and the experts, he's saying that there is no superimposed strata layers. Now, I know within the strata layers, you can find um, different uh, 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 archaeology within a strata layer, but it's not like in uh, Mesopotamia where it goes down layers, layers, layers deep, or even in Tel El Daba, we'll say. You have this, you still have this dark earth and its material thrown around in various places, not uniform throughout Europe, but you do have this dark earth thrown around covering uh, aqueducts, et cetera. And yes, it appears, even considering Illig and both Heinz on it still appears that it comes to a crashing halt in terms of style, um, way coins are being minted, et cetera, around the 10th century. Um, he yeah. even showed some things from a Polish museum where Poland goes back to just being primitive. He's like, yo, man, everybody's dressing like, uh, you know, like peasants now. It goes yeah. from everything yeah. in high society to being peasants. And that kind of really never made sense to me. I'm going to read this last one here. Germany's first millennium architecture 
Before 1000 AD, we know how many years he lived after Christ, and we agree with that. Um, therefore, today, therefore, how can we be capable of knowing early AD dates down to the month and day? Even Charlemagne had no idea that he came 700 years after Domitian or Trajan. The Pius yeah. Christian, and I'll, uh, <laughs> sorry, had never heard that he was crowned emperor 800 years after Christ. The only certainty is that the architecture of the ninth century looks like that of the sec second century, 700 years earlier. And, you know, you, you are pretty much saying then that uh, we're going through Renaissance. Heinz Son is saying, well, we're not going through Renaissance. We're going through a time capsule of frozen in time, you know, of, of stagnation, essentially. Yeah. Um, two different ways of looking at the same thing. And I'm not yeah. here to say, well, no, this guy's wrong or that guy's right. It's just to present it and show people there's a bigger, broader body of work. There is no true consensus. But Heinz Son... His papers definitely like that 10th century CE collapse. I didn't read the paper because it's more of a paper. I think that thing has 25,000 downloads. And then collectively with everything else, it's like he's up to 38,000. His sociological yeah. paper, papers on economy and uh, even the Holocaust don't get as many views and downloads as this stuff here. Yeah. So that's at least to his benefit, if you will. Um, nonetheless, yeah. if you want to just kind of rebuttal that and, you know, We'll just kind of play by ear. We're we're a little yeah. Over as out. I say, it's, it's not true to say that there's no um, stratigraphic uh, differentiation between the third, or the, the fourth, fifth, sixth century, and the, the they are. In fact, it was Gunnar himself that pointed out to me the um, the stratigraphy of Byblos, uh, which was uh, which was published by the French uh, archaeologist Dunand. I can't remember exactly when. I think it was the 1930s. But it clearly shows a, uh, it clearly shows a, uh, an imperial Roman um, stratum, uh, first, second, third, and then above that Byzantine stratum, fourth, fifth, sixth century. And one thing that was lacking was a Umayyad or Abbasid stratum from the six hundreds up to the up to the eleven hundreds. In fact, the next building at Byblos is. Crusader, late tenth century, a uh, late eleventh century. Sorry. So there's a four four hundred year hiatus there, but there, there is a what is important to remember is that Dunand did find a Byzantine strata above an imperial Roman strata, and as I say, there's there's the same uh, pattern at Rome, at San Clemente, the church. There's a there's a fifth century ch uh, church. Uh, literally several meters above a second century Mithra, Mithra, or temple to Mithras, or Mithraeum, as they were called. So um, I would dispute that. But anyway, there's no question. I, I, I hand it to Gunnar. He, he, you know, he, he gets you thinking and he challenges you. And um, there's, there's, a, there's certainly, he's thrown up a huge number of problems for um for conventional uh, scholarship to answer, which they haven't even, bothered to even even acknowledging yet, you know. Not to interrupt. Even Sorry? On, you know, even, not to interrupt, but even on his behalf, uh, when we've talked, you're talking about different churches and different building structures, maybe at different elevations, but still within the same strata. Though the dark earth, there's no, usually no archaeology within that. It's covering things, which, you know, again... Yeah. Like London Wick and, the, and Ludonium, Luton Wick and the Ludonian, there's still a conundrum of issues. We we've talked about this, you know, many yeah, times, yeah. many times over. Um, one more, I'm going to go to one more um, set of slides just because, um, and I'll see what we have here. This is the uh, Saint Paul. Did he live once, thrice, or not at all? And I like to tell people when we did the first interview, I put those slides together and kind of dictated how we were going to do it. It wasn't just his presentation. He put the slides together for his Exodus presentation, but I had a lot packed into it. it kind of jumped around a lot. Yeah. Um, and as I'm looking through these slides, I'm seeing if we have anything else that we may have missed. It's back to, you know, he puts a lot of the same information stratigraphically into the same slides. So he talks about the um, Paulinus of the first and second century AD. And yeah. we have the Paulicians of the 8th and 9th century A.D. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the artwork and the, and the um, basilica floors and tiles from the 1st century, 
and it's during the time of St. Paul and the Paulinists to the time of the Paulicians from the 8th to 9th century are still strikingly similar, though, you know, we could be doing a renaissance over and over again, or it could be more contemporary. I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. Yeah, of um, course, yeah. Once, once again, you know, there, there, there's just a lot of enigmatic, um, more of Krautheimer's comparisons of the uh, churches and, and, and floor plans. And I said, when I look this stuff up, they're pretty much crumbled, <laughs> crumbled up foundations there's really nothing there um yeah. you know to substantiate i you know i can see parts of it like he has comparisons here and ground plans when i started looking these up one at a time you know it, it yeah they're it, it's very crude they're, they're foundations i'm gonna be quite honest they're foundations um still something that's quite odd because on the the uh, parent channel to this channel there's a lot of talk between the first and fourth centuries with church history. Yeah. Then, you know, for, for me even, and I'm just kind of um, monologuing a little bit now, then it becomes, an, you know, we have the, the Crusades. The plague, I think you were just talking about, wasn't that plague in the 1300s where it took Europe some yeah. time to come out of that one? And the women. Yeah, that was yeah. the great plague of, it was that the 14th, was, that was, 1350s yeah, that, or something. Like, that yeah. happened right after the Crusades. And I know during the Crusades, you know, the Crusaders bypassed Rome and went to what we'll call Byzantium. And from what I've read, the people in Byzantium thought that the Christian Crusaders were a bit odd and had a yeah. fantasy about Jerusalem, whatever, you know, not get into the politics of that. Nonetheless, they still marched on Jerusalem and went to war with what was called today um, Muslims or Arabs and, uh, and Jews. Yeah, so all these all these things kind of intertwine and twist together, though we're we're in agreement, especially with um, you know the Germanic barbarians and and the and the and the Huns and all these different people who are kind of rogue, and we're led to believe that they're living in mud huts and they're not under Roman authority like the Anglo Saxons yeah. will say yeah. fourth century look to be more contemporary at least at that point with the uh, Roman. Uh, antiquity, uh, but a lot of nuances to it. I tell yes. people it, 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 there are a lot of nuances, and we we talk about this stuff a lot when we do communicate. Um, yeah. Again, you know, it's it's both works are intriguing. It just so happens that Gunner puts pushes a lot more out. And I'm not saying, you know, because he's claiming he ha we have sources to this stuff, and he's going to the experts and he's talked about it. Um, still quite peculiar, but nonetheless. We get to that Renaissance period, and that's when it gets more interesting because we hit the Renaissance. And now there's going to be transatlantic contact as we move forward in history. Um, yeah. Now we're getting to the point where the literary works still of antiquity are being reconstructed, like um, uh, Isubius's work and Manetho's work and, and everything that came with uh, Scaliger's chronology up to um, William Loftus. I mean, that's what we talk about, you know, constantly that this historical, um, you know, us going down the yellow brick road, the yellow brick yeah. road has recently been paved for us, but it may not be paved correctly and still within the right time frame. So we're haggling with, with, with Illig and Heinzen over several hundred years. 300 yeah. or 700? Is it 300 or 600? I say yeah. there's still time that w w we can't account for within yeah. that first planning. It's kind, of, it's kind of difficult, though. Um, just for the people out there, if you want to read more, again, I left the, uh, I'll leave the um, articles in, in the link and to these uh, uh, papers. The main problem, Sean, is that so far the uh, academic establishment has completely ignored all of the problems presented both by Illiga and by Heinsohn. And that is that is a major problem. You know, they've kind of buried their head in the sand and uh, pretended like it's just not there. You know, there's nothing there, nothing to see. Um, and uh, these guys are just nutcases or conspiracy theorists or whatever, you know. And, uh, you know, we we talked about this before, this, this um, refusal uh, to reconsider fundamentals, you know, it's all about tinkering around the edges and, you know, uh, 
uh, fine tuning a little date here and there, but there's not there's not there's no willingness at all to look at the basics and look at the fundamentals, and that's a big problem because it's holding us back. And um, mm. these problems are just uh, the problems are identified by, by both the league and by Henson are just only um, multiplying. And uh, there's no attempt, as I say, by the academic establishment to even look at them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, we're going to conclude here. thought, you know, because, again, uh, prep time for me is something I don't have a lot of anymore. Um, me and Emmett talking, you know, I have a very busy schedule, and it's hard for me at times to cram this stuff in, though I do. But the goal here at Var Valley, at least for the interviews I'm doing, is to attempt to bring the dialogue more full circle with people that are associated with and involved with the Thunderbolts project, plain and simple, because these are the people who have ties and connections back to that um, 90, 1994 symposium in Oregon. It, there were a number of speakers, including Gunnar Heinsohn. That community is a little bit dis disconnected when it comes to looking at everything. And I'm going to say it that way. Science and mythology within that group really takes precedence, at least through videos and through communication. And the historical yeah. end of it is pushed a little bit off to the side. That community needs to, excuse me, come back together and we need to have bigger dialogues, bigger yeah. dialogues, much bigger yeah. dialogues. And we, I think we can uh, have much bigger dialogues about all of the nuances to Velikovsky's work, um, et cetera, et cetera, so on. That's what I'm really yeah. aiming to do here. And it, it still is fitting I think to go with the ages in chaos way, <laughs> that way, we can even branch off into the mankind and amnesia also back to worlds in collision and back to um, earth and upheaval. That all that is, is very important. I do have a rough outline of a paper that I was going to present at the 2020 conference that never happened, but it was a geological sequencing paper that if we yeah. had to, try to sequence the geology, where we start, how we do it. And I looked at geology throughout the, the, the earth, basically, and just bought up um, subject matter of what could and should be investigated and how, how do we even really begin an investigation. Um, nonetheless, all of it is relevant over on this side, is what I say, the science, the history, the mytho history, um, it all ties in together. And then our human Amnesia. This is a part of the human amnesia uh, cycle that we talk about, that Velikovsky talked about. And it's still, uh, I would say, a work in progress, even 70 some years later, after yep. Worlds and Collection. No matter what some people may think, it's still a work in progress. But to me, it needs to be integrated. I'm using my hands. It has to be all integrated. If it's integrated properly, then, then uh, maybe academia will take it more serious. I know Gunner's at least pushed that way. I, you know, wish sometimes that we would have done this while he was still alive. You know, again, um, Wall Thornhill, uh, we had an interview planned for with him. And after some time, lost contact and he passed away. Then Gunnar Heinsohn passed away. So I'm like, wow, you know, that's something that we could have done. Uh, but because of my schedule, we put it off. And it's like, wow, we could have had a bigger dialogue going on whenever uh, Gunnar was, was um, alive. Again, it's just some, sometimes how things happen, but it's still yeah. my goal and my aim to try to bring the, that community together more through more of a diverse um, range of, of subject matter. Everybody has their own little twist, which is good, too, but it sh still should be bought together somehow, even through separate interviews and then group interviews, um, get people's input uh, like we're doing right now today. I don't want to... Uh, get too long winded, but I do want to end the, the call now. It's about or the show notes about one hour and 30 minutes in. Um, we're going to take a slight hiatus myself and um, Emmett. Emmett's going to do some traveling and he has some business to tend to. Um, I do have to get back to work Monday myself and I still have a laundry list of things to get done when it comes to the show and my DJ stuff and music and whatnot. Uh, I call this my left brain, uh, and then my music is my right brain. So I need to catch up with the right brain a little bit more and uh, still kind of tie both together. W once again, I'd like to thank you, Emmett, for the conversation. Um, Thanks for like, having me. I'd like everybody to like and please 
uh, subscribe to the video. Um, once again, I'm DJ Shonsky, Sean DJ Shonsky Andrews. I'm your host, um, and I would like to bid you farewell, and everybody have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much.